Neil O'Dowd of the Irish Voice newspaper in the United States is probably one of the best known members of the Irish diaspora, not just in the United States, but around the world. He was very involved with the Northern Ireland peace process. And I asked him how important the diaspora in North America was in that process. Well, I don't think there would have been a successful peace process without the Irish diaspora, particularly what happened when that diaspora first approached then Canada Clinton and ascertained his positions on Ireland and where he was coming from. And if you remember at the time, President Clinton referred back to his time in Oxford University, uh, which coincided with the birth of the civil rights movement in Northern Ireland. And he was deeply influenced at that point. And even though he was from Arkansas and didn't have any immediately identifiable Irish roots, something in his past had triggered an interest in Ireland. And so when I went to see him in Arkansas in 1990, he was still thinking back in those days and had followed the issue right through. So it was incredibly important that there had been a connected connection point. And then once we began to talk to him, he became extremely interested. And being you know, just one of the brightest politicians I'd ever met, he certainly understood immediately the implications if an American president took a role in the Irish peace process, what would actually happen? And that had never been attempted. There had been various presidents who had expressed an interest in it, but nobody had actually gone in there and taken a position. And what he had promised us during the campaign was that A, he would appoint a special envoy to Northern Ireland, which eventually became George Mitchell, and B, he would give a, a visa to Gerry Adams, the leader of Sinn Féin, to come to America, which would immediately break the international isolation of Sinn Féin and really empower the people within Sinn Féin who wanted to go down a political path rather than continue the violence. So when he was elected, we felt very, very strongly that this was the moment for Irish America to come forward and say, we can deliver significant progress for the Irish peace process. We knew the peace process was on the way. We knew John Hume and Gerry Adams had been meeting. We knew there had been some discussions with the Irish government. But we were never fully aware of what the background was. But we knew that we, as the Americans, were ready to play our role. And we went back soon after President uh, Clinton was elected with the tacit approval of the White House to talk to Sinn Féin, to talk to all the parties in Northern Ireland and to discover where they were. And every one of them told us, which is tremendous information for us, that they wanted a way out, that they realised that it was going into another generation. It was a time of the Israeli-Palestinian peace process, looked like it was going to be successful. It was a time of the South African peace process when Nelson Mandela had emerged from prison and a whole new development was occurring. And we felt that with the end of the 20th century, that now was the time. And we certainly he heard that back from leaders like Gerry Adams, from leaders particularly on the loyalist side, people like David Irvine, uh, people like Gary McMichael. We met with David Trimble, uh, who wasn't the leader of the party then. But we got this sense that, irrespective of what the media was reporting, there was a great sense of weariness and a great sense of a need for an outreach. And we felt that America could provide that vital missing component and that Irish Americans had to undertake the task of bringing that component to bear. And we did that. And when we secured the visa for Gerry Adams over the opposition of all the, uh, the other parties in the American government, including the State Department, the FBI, the CIA, when President Clinton made that very principled decision, he transformed the entire peace process. And Gerry Adams has said to me on a number of occasions that that brought forward the IRA ceasefire by at least 12 to 18 months which was a massive, massive step forward. So I think that we played our role. We were one of three main parties to the Irish peace process, the Irish government, the parties in Northern Ireland, and Irish America. And I think after the, the IRA ceasefire occurred, everything then became possible. And that had been our experience in America, that you had to stop the violence first before you could ever bring about any kind of a complete process. And President Clinton, once he became involved, as you know, became very deeply involved, and I think his trip to Ireland in 1995 was so historic because it was the first time that an American president had gone to Northern Ireland. And um, as I stood on that street in Belfast that day with half a million people chanting, Bill, 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 uh, I realised something fundamental had changed, that there was no way of going back now. America was invested in the Irish peace process. The President of the United States had come to walk on the Shankill Road and the Falls Road. He had spoken to the people of Northern Ireland and he had promised he would stand with them. And, and how he stood with them was fascinating. He didn't need to send armies, he didn't need to send gunships. He sent a man called George Mitchell. And George Mitchell sat in the hotel room for four years, almost five years in Northern Ireland, and essentially brought about what became the great document called the Good Friday Agreement. And without George Mitchell, without Bill Clinton, without the initial intervention of Irish America, 
I am convinced, and I think most people in Ireland would tell you the same thing, that there would not have been a peace process without the involvement of the President of the United States. So we think it's very, very important for groups around the world who have large communities in the United States to keep them informed, to keep them active, to, to realise that sometimes peace is about more than what politicians can do, but it's about what individuals in an ethnic community can do. And when we reached out to the parties in Northern Ireland, we were amazed at what we actually discovered when we went and talked to them, as against what the prevailing wisdom about these people was. And I think that was the most exciting thing for us to discover. Yes, we had a role, because they said to us, look, we're all stuck in the one place. This is a, 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 a no-win game. Any move we make, the other side makes and counters it. So what we need is somebody from outside to bring in this whole new dimension. And the people who came from the outside were the Americans. And, and they were led by the President of the United States. And as a result, we've had the most successful peace process, certainly of the late 20th century, and certainly one that has saved thousands of lives in Ireland. So it's not impossible for people to empower themselves, to become involved in the process, which can often be too important to be left to just politicians. And I, I urge people around the world, and I've talked to people from Sri Lanka, people from other peace processes, and I've talked to them about what the Irish experience has been. And I think the Irish-American experience has overwhelmingly been one to get involved, see what you can do, don't be afraid. You know, there'll be a lot of people who will say, no, nothing can be done, like they said to us. But the reality is that when we became involved, it became very, very successful. Great. That's, that's wonderful. Um, are there, you, you talk on the political side, are there other examples of ways in which the diaspora can get involved in a peace process which can be beneficial? I think there's no question that the economic uh, aspect of a peace process is incredibly important. And again, under President Clinton, the economic conferences that he, that he brought together, when he brought together the top leaders from Irish America, the leaders from organisations like the American Ireland Fund, the businessmen, the, the people who knew how to put business together, when they came together in Washington and we brought in all the politicians from Northern Ireland and all the business leaders, it began an interaction. Uh, we appointed, we, we were successful in getting an economic envoy appointed to Northern Ireland. And, and that kind of help is deeply treasured by people in the community who are not involved in the political front line but want to know what does this mean for me, what does it mean for my kids, what does it mean for my job prospects. And I think what, what the Irish peace process very cleverly did was involve an entire economic aspect of it where the best brains were brought to bear, where we all gathered in Washington and sat down and listened to presentations, where the United States President said he would do everything in his power to help investment in Northern Ireland. And in fact in many cases that was very, very successful. And, and is to this day. And it gave a focus to, to the community here for people who couldn't be involved uh, basically on the cold face, but gave them an, an option, an alternative to become involved in helping economically. Because in the end of the day, if a Catholic kid has a job and a Protestant kid has a job, it makes it an awful lot easier for them to see each other as human beings and not as someone who's a rival for one job. And I think from that point of view, the economic aspect cannot be overstressed. That it's incredibly important for business people from whatever community they're from, to see how they could be of assistance if a political issue has to be has to be solved. And looking into your crystal ball, finally, um, you know this this engagement of the Irish diaspora here and the interest globally in diasporas. How can you see this develop, and what does, what needs to happen to make it develop and accelerate in the next five to ten years? I think we can learn an awful lot from what other people have successfully achieved. I think we learned an awful lot from the South African peace process. We learned much from the Israeli-Palestinian process. Uh, one of the things we learned is that you have to be lucky, uh, you have to be committed, and it's a very patient process. If you go back and look at the Irish peace process, it actually began in 1989, and it continued through basically until the signing of the final agreements in 2007. That's a very long time, but people never gave up. You can't just pick up a peace process and drop it two years later because nothing has happened. You have to work every day, every week, every year at some aspect of it that creates progress. And that's the lesson of the Irish process, that Jerry Adams and John Hume sat down a long time ago and said, you know, we need to do something here. And it took all that time and all that development over the years and the economic aspect of it. And it's the same for any process, that none of these things happen easily. But you cannot despair, and I think that's the lesson that is the most uh, has the most credulity for me that you can't despair that you have to keep working it and you have to be lucky you have to have leaders that come along like Tony Blair John Major uh, George Mitchell Bill Clinton you know uh, Albert Reynolds Bertie Ahern people who contributed enormously to the success of the process who took political courage to do what they did but they achieved an extraordinary outcome and if you talk to Bill Clinton today if you talk to Tony Blair today 
I'm sure if you talk to Bertie O'Hearn or Albert Reynolds, they'll say the same thing, that this was one of the great moments of the presidency or their, or their time in office. In fact, Bill Clinton has said that about his visit to Belfast in '95, that it was one of the great moments of his presidency. So there is a huge upside, but you have to be incredibly patient. You have to be very tolerant. You have to go sit and talk like George Mitchell did all those years, sitting in a hotel in Belfast, talking, talking, talking. And yet, if you had suggested when he began that talk that someday Ian Paisley and Martin McGuinness, the former head of the IRA and the most extreme unionist leader, would somehow sit down and be in government, people would have said, you know, I know a good uh, psychiatrist. And yet it happened. And it happened because people persisted. And persistence is the word that I would use more than anything else.